In December last year, a colleague of mine in a U.S. university uh, contacted me and said, Gary, we would like you to do our annual lecture in 2022. A few weeks later, he sent me the title, which simply said, Is Religion Bad Use for Human Rights? I began that lecture in March of this year, doing it virtually, and I said, I have to categorically say that in many, many occasions, religion is incredibly bad use for human rights. I knew that from personal experience. I lived through the Irish conflict, uh, Northern Ireland or the north of Ireland, even 25 years next year after the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, we still not can even agree on the name of that particular but over a 30-year period, in that tiny space of 1.7 million people, we had 47,000 injuries, 36,000 shootings, 30,000 people went through our penal system, with 22,000 armed robberies, 16,000 bombings, and almost 4,000 if I was to extrapolate those figures into the United States and simply say if the Northern Irish conflict had have happened in your space over a 30-year period, you would have had 9 million injuries, 7 million shootings, 6 million political prisoners, 3 million bombings, and 700,000 dead. Suffice to say, even that 25 years after, the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, when I spent time in my native island of Ireland, I'm mostly dealing with legacy, dealing with the past, or dealing, to put it bluntly, with what I define as toxic religion and toxic politics. Let me tell you a story about three young boys, kids growing up in the 60s and 70s, born into a conflict not of their making, uh, two of those young boys went to what we would call a uh, religious Sunday school together. 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. regularly as kids, they heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Two of those other kids from the age of four to the age of 11 went to primary school together. Walked that one mile journey for five, six years of their lives. Uh, one of those boys is now dead. He chose political violence or terrorism. He was shot in the back during an internal paramilitary feud. The second boy served a life sentence for murder, who also chose the way of violence. I'm the third boy who ends up a Methodist clergy person. I actually refuse to let people spiritualize that story. Because many people say to me, oh, Gary, God's hand was upon you. That's why you didn't make that choice. I don't know. And I still don't know. Is there such a thing as a theology of luck? I just don't know. And while what many of my boyfriends did in those early, early years were fundamentally wrong, it's not enough just to condemn them. You have to ask what happened and that space, and I often say to folk in the States, the highest church-going figures in the Western world are shocker in the Southern States and, yes, Northern Ireland. As a friend of mine once said, someone in the late 1960s did not fly over Northern Ireland, sprays over lunatic gas, and we woke up one day and decided to start killing each other. We had in our space what I believe you have now in the United States linguistic violence in the public space, both politically and religiously. And as another boy said to me, who ended up murdering two Catholics, he said, you know, Gary, I heard a speech in the early 1970s from a religious fundamentalist leader, and he said to me, you know, Gary, it lit a fire within my soul. I said, well, Billy, it was not the fire of the Holy Spirit. It was a fire of blatant religious sectarianism. Now, what Billy did was wrong. But the people that made those speeches in the public space, 
using what I call toxic theology and toxic religion need to take some of the blame. But shocker, as religious leaders, they never did. It was always the other person. It wasn't their linguistic violence in the public space. So let's be honest with Jonathan Sachs, the brilliant Jewish theologian who died a couple of years ago of cancer, rightly said, on one point, and it is a substantial one, the critics of religion are right. Religion has done harm. It has led the pogroms, inquisitions, jihads, etc., etc. People have spilled the blood of human sacrifice in the name of high ideals. People have hated in the name of the God of love, practiced cruelty in the name of the God of compassion, waged war in the name of the God of peace, and killed in the name of the God of life. I mean, those are undeniable facts, and they're absolutely terrifying. But that's no shock, because Religious leaders of another generation knew this categorically. Pascal said, men never do evil so completely and cheerfully as when they do it from a religious conviction. Gulliver's Travel, written by the dean of Christ Church in Dublin, Jonathan Swift said, we have enough religion to make us hate one another but not enough religion to make us love one another. And my own fellow countryman, C.S. Lewis, who when I'm home in Belfast, even at my age, shocker, I still play squash every Tuesday night, and C.S. Lewis's boyhood home faces my rugby club where I play squash. C.S. Lewis said this, I think we must fully face the fact that when Christianity does not make a man very much better, invariably it makes him very much worse. Remember a couple of years ago during a lecture in York, St. John University in England, and a young Japanese professor coming out with this brilliant quotation where she said, an incomprehensible act becomes comprehensible when told in conjunction with religion. And so, while I love the church, while I've served the church, uh, my motto has been, and I say this unashamedly, I hold God quite tightly. I hold the church rather loosely. I've stood many, many times in Poland in Auschwitz-Birkenau, one of the largest graveyards in the world, 1.3 million people. And Adolf Hitler wrote in the second chapter of Mein Kampf, now, Hitler was no card-carrying evangelical or observant Catholic or progressive Christian. But he said this, Today I believe I'm acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator in defending myself against the Jews. And as Rolf Hilberg rightly said, the church came along. Always remember, uh, it wasn't the Nazis invented the ghetto. It was the, the church, the Christian church. Papal Bull, July 1555, developed a ghetto in Rome. The first ghettos were in Venice, the Venetian ghettos. And as one writer rightly said, the Christian church said, you Jews of no right, singular, to live among us. The secular rulers come along and say, you Jews of no rights, plural, to live among us. And Hitler comes and says, you Jews have no right to live. So Hitler wasn't uh, discarding the past. Hitler was building upon the past. And I've seen that evidentially in my space and in many other spaces where I work globally. As Jules Isaac, the French historian, says, the teaching of contempt. I see a lot of teaching of contempt at the moment within the United States. I live with the teaching of contempt for decades and we decided the best way to deal with it is to move into a bloody, religious, violent, political, internal civil war. But this is nothing new. Jesus wrestled with the same concepts in the first century. I mean, contextually, the Jewish people were under the jackboot of the most efficient military machine on planet Earth, namely the Roman army. And do you remember the encounter Jesus had? We end up calling it the Good Samaritan, that parable. But the story goes, 
a highly intelligent, articulate young lawyer comes to Jesus, asks him a question all of us have asked in this building, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus quotes from the sacred text, from the Torah, and then he finishes with that text we know about loving your neighbor as yourself. He pokes him a little bit more. Tell me, uh, who is my neighbor? Now, I don't know this young lawyer, but as I analyze this context, both theologically and psychologically, the answer he wanted was this. My neighbor is like me. He goes to the same church. He's the same theology. He dresses like me. He likes the same wine as me. But Jesus dares. Now, this is the Son of God. Yeah, yeah, the Son of God. So the Son of God picks a person whose theology is incredibly suspect, to put it mildly, and uses them as an illustration. But look at that text. In it, the young lawyer, Luke tells us, sought to test or tempt Jesus. As I look at the U.S. at the moment, and I look at my own space with Brexit and other chaos, why do we spend so much damn time in our churches pushing, testing, tempting the other person? Seems to be a particular hobby in the United States at the moment. The text further goes on and says that the young lawyer sought to justify himself, justify his theological position over against the other person's theological position. What does Jesus do? He turns the whole thing in his head. Who is my neighbor? Wrong question. Who is being a neighbor? And there is an absolute profound difference. February this year, March this year, I knew, even though I only knew a few of you, what you were all doing. You were like my wife Joyce and I. You were glued to CNN, Fox News, BBC, ITV, wondering, will Putin invade or will he not invade? And eventually he did. And most people still seem to see this conflict through a geopolitical lens. We're missing the religious dynamic. And the religious dynamic is this. Another Vladimir Putin, or Vladimir, king of the Rus, in 988 was converted to Christianity. In Kiev, and he insisted on a mass baptism in the Deptner River. There and then, the Holy Mother Russian Church was born. So you're all sitting wondering in those early days, why do you want Kiev? And as Putin said himself, Kiev is the soul, the spiritual heart, the value system of the Orthodox Church of Belarus, Russia, and yes, the Ukraine. Putin in recent days has authorized mosaics of himself in a Russian Orthodox church. Pictures of Putin and Stalin, a mass murderer of 9 million to 50 million people. His face sits alongside Putin's face. Pictures of the taking of Crimea. Be careful of political leaders who use ethnic, religious nationalism to prop up their political systems. They are absolutely toxic and destructive. The senior Russian Orthodox patriarch said, to my mind, Vladimir Putin is a miracle from God. This is a mass murderer using ethnic religious identity to justify rape, genocide, and land grabs. But why did Jesus not do that, Gary, in the first century? I mean, Jesus the boot of the Roman military machine was in Jesus' neck and the neck of his people. Why did he not raise up an efficient military machine and drive those Romans out? The option was there. But he chose a different type of kingdom. Politics are temporal. The gospel is eternal. I've spent my life working in the area of politics with a small p, meeting with people, pursuing political violence, meeting with politicians right and left, bringing as many actors of all extremes into sacred space for uncomfortable conversations. That's been my life. I was ordained in May 1987. It's been 35 years of my human existence. 
But I do know this, that Jesus preached an eternal kingdom. And I most certainly want eternal values to influence politics. I don't deny that. But I do know this, that when the final eschatological curtain falls on planet Earth, and trust me, one day it will, it will not be Vladimir Putin, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, Barack Obama, Boris Johnson, Margaret Thatcher, standing on this final stage. There'll be one person, just one, called Jesus Christ. And Putin, and Thatcher, and Trump, and Biden, and Obama will realize they were simply two-bit actors in a drama produced by another person called Jesus Christ. So I'm asking you tonight, what are you throwing your lot in with? The temporal or the eternal? What's going to shape your value system? As one writer there said a couple of years ago, commenting on the United States, the state of our politics reflects the state of our soul. If his analysis is right, you're in bother. So why is the church not spilling into the public space? Into the public square and occupying those spaces again. Within Methodism, with this kind of a twin track approach to theology, a personal holiness and social holiness. And uh, John Stott, the uh, evangelical, the Anglican evangelical who died at the age of 92 says, you cut off one wing of the bird, the bird collapses. That's why our churches are so ineffective. We're hiding behind fortress doors instead of spilling into the public square and taking those eternal values and the eternal kingdom into the public space. George McLeod, a theologian of another generation, said this. I argue again that the cross be raised at the center of the marketplace as well as on the steeple of the church. I'm recovering the claim that Jesus was not crucified in a cathedral between two candles, but on a cross between two thieves. At a crossroads so cosmopolitan that they had to write his name in Hebrew, Latin, and in Greek. At a crossroads so cosmopolitan where cynics talk smut and Roman soldiers gamble. But that is where he died. And that is what he died about. And that is what God's kingdom should be about. So I'm asking you tonight, are you going to throw your lot in with a temporal system or the eternal kingdom and allow those eternal values to shape your space? It's a choice I think the church has to make. But I think many people of a younger generation and many in their 20s and 30s often use that Quotation, Gary, we are looking for truth that is lived. And that the lived experience in your space at the moment and in my space is representing the eternal kingdom of God. I'm looking for other options. So I'm asking you tonight, are you choosing the temporal or choosing the eternal? The choice is absolutely crucial.